Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, David. How are you today? I am doing fine. Thanks for having me on today. I'm delighted to have you on. And I've, I've read a lot about what you've been up to. So I'm really interested to learn how somebody like you has so many books in them. <laughs> You know, and, and you know what? I think the people I, I went to to high school here in America went uh, went to high school with probably have the same question. Like, wait, you, you wrote a book? And I'm like, I, I've written five. Like, that's not the kid I grew up with. But you know, part of it's yeah. part of it's business. Part of it's the importance of of sharing wisdom and uh, raising your credibility, and it's all part of the journey. Great, that's great. I'd love to hear your story. So getting on to that so i just have one opening question for you and that is david can you tell us your story and how did you get to where you are today absolutely you know every, you. everybody's got a story everybody's got a um, and in many cases it's an unexpected journey that gets you to where you are and um, first i'll give you some reference of what i do today uh, and then I'll tell you how I got to where I am today. Um, I'm, a, I'm a keynote speaker and consultant and author, and I help business owners and entrepreneurs and professionals compete against uh, an increasingly difficult uh, competitive marketplace by becoming ridiculously easy to do business with. The broad subject is customer experience. Uh, I don't talk on customer service. I mean, I I think we've been talking about it for 50 years. If you don't know how to treat people, I think you've yes. got bigger issues. But how we experience doing business, and that's what I do. I work with organizations. How did I get there? My story, I, I grew up in um, in Denver, Colorado, in America. And uh, I've always been a performer, which is kind of interesting. It had nothing to do with the content today. But uh, I'm the second oldest of, of six kids. And I guess in any situation wow. like that, People are fighting for attention, you know, to get noticed. <laughs> very busy parents. My father was a rocket scientist, like a real rocket scientist. Wow. He invented the first cameras that ever took pictures on the surface of another planet. Uh, my dad worked on all the Mars missions and everything else. Um, but I always joke, even one of my books at the very, very front, I dedicated it to my father. And I said, who doesn't really understand what I do, but he loves me anyway and supports me. He's very proud of me. Um, yes. He was that, that scientist rock. And I was sort of the, the extroverted uh, communicator. And so mm. all through school, I did, I did theater, I did music. Um, and I ended up going to, to university on a full scholarship in America. Of course, we have to pay tremendous amounts of money for our schooling uh, yes. and uh, doing theater and music. And um it, it was kind of interesting because I was the uh, I was the only straight guy in the entire department. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but the the reality was I realized at some point I got to support a wife and kids, and I was having a great time performing. But I knew I had to really make a living someday, and because I yes. had this deep voice, and everybody talks about you know, wow, you should be in radio. Uh, yes. I went to local radio, went to the local radio station, and so I I was a disc jockey on the radio at the More Music ninety six KGBS. Uh, in my early days in college. And then I, I gave up my scholarship. I made a, a complete change and I, and I changed to broadcast journalism. Um, and so I, I did that for a lot of years and ended up working for a newspaper for a short time. And then I went to the dark side, as my, uh, yeah. as my colleagues in the press would say, and I became a PR flag. But I've always sort of been in that promotion. Like, how do we promote businesses? How do we tell stories? How do we do it in a compelling way that convinces other people to tell our story for us? Now, yes. back in those days, you went to the news stations and their channels, and you went to the newspapers and the radio stations to try and convince them to have you on as a guest, to tell your story, to write a story about us. But of course, the world has changed. And now we have our own channels. Yeah. And those are on YouTube and social media and others as well. And so... After a lot of years of, of doing marketing and public relations, had my own marketing firm, um, I, I went on my own to, um, I had my own firm, but I went on my own when I realized that you could actually make a living teaching others to do what it is you do. And I, and I discovered the world of professional speaking. And I wouldn't say that I'm a motivation speaker. I wouldn't say that at all. Those tend to be the mountain climbers and the cancer survivors and the Olympic athletes and others. Uh, I'm a business speaker. 
And what yes. I do, it's really humorous. It's very entertaining. It's part of what I do, but I use that strategically to temper a pretty tough message about what it takes to compete and win. So my story is I have been on stage in various capacities my whole life as a singer, um, as an actor for a short time. I sang at an acapella group. Uh, if you've seen the movie Pitch Perfect, it was, it was that kind of work post-college. And we had CDs out. It was a great way to spend my 20s. And not only did I have a mullet, I had a permed mullet. That's how... <laughs> 80s I was and my kids were like oh my god dad it's so embarrassing I'm like no, people used to want daddy's autograph yeah whatever dad yeah but today at, at 59 years old um I'm in the greatest place in my life and I get to travel the world when there's not a pandemic and talk to audiences and organizations and professionals to help them see their customers in a different light and not just the transaction that's available but to really understand how we have changed uh, in terms of our expectations and COVID yes. in many ways accelerated that. So that's my story and where I am today. Um, I'm very fortunate to travel. My, my my mom passed away at 69 years old and never owned a passport. Most wow. Americans don't own a passport, which I is know. still crazy. And I've been very fortunate to speak in 25 countries around the world. And uh, and so today I'm, I'm busy again. As a matter of fact, an hour from now, I, I take off for, a, for another speaking engagement. I was in Phoenix yesterday and Chicago the day before. And I'm really, really, really lucky to do what I do. Um, not everybody has a job where people applaud for them at the end of the day. You know, it's pretty <laughs> surreal. You know, I, talk, I said, no, I guess the guarantee the people who are building cars don't get a, a standing ovation when they leave at the end. So it's kind of ridiculous to be to be clear, but uh, it's really humbling as well. And so I, yeah. that's where I am. I love what I do. Brilliant. Well, thank you for for that quick kind of thumbnail sketch about your journey, how you got into what you're doing. I have a few questions, though, and sure. uh, that come up in thinking about it, because um. Obviously, you had an affinity to acting, uh, which gave you that confidence, the extraversion, extraversion that you had in your in your youth. But is there a thread in your family? Obviously, not your dad, but was it on his side or the mother's side where there was somebody in the family who was like that? Yeah, that that's you a got great the question. From yeah. Yeah, I, I think for my mom, my mom was very extroverted. Think, um, think Liza Minnelli with another 20 pounds and no filter. You know, she was bigger than life. It's crazy, crazy woman. She's passed away um, about 13 years ago. And, and she, mm. was, she was hilarious. Now, of yes. course, as her child, and I'm the second oldest of six kids, um, in many ways, it was very embarrassing. It was really mortifying because she was just a big personality, bigger than life. And of course, as an adult, and as, certainly as she has passed, I've come to appreciate so much more. As a kid, you know, it's embarrassing when your mom is is um, you know has a has a, a mouth like a sailor, and and sometimes would would curse quite a bit. But she was funny. She was hilarious. She was a salesperson. And right. so people would come in, and she'd say, "Hello, my sweetheart," and you know, big huggers and very ethnic. And my father was was very affectionate, um, really wonderful dad, super brilliant, but a very different personality. Yes. What's funny is what's funny is my mom, I think, had hoped that all of her children would end up being like the Von Trapp children, and we would all be singers and performers, <laughs> and that she could be this this stage mother, which of course she would have been. Um, but nobody else in my family could sing. So it was kind of funny that um, she had sort of had the, this this vision that we would become the Jackson Five or the Osmonds or the Von Trapps. And Alas, you know, I got a brother who's an attorney and another one who's who's a sports writer for the Associated Press. We're all pretty successful, but but never the performing troupe that I think she no. had always hoped for. Well, they're performing in their own way, of course. But and, absolutely. But no, but I think I, that's the, the thread for me is that is that I've, yes. I've been in front of audiences my whole life. I've had that real comfort. Of course, yes. people talk about professional speaking or speaking in front of a group is always like the top fear. People are afraid of public yes. speaking. Um, yes. Like death, I think is seventh on the list. But I tell him, I said, I guarantee you, the people of Ukraine right now are not worried that they have to stand up and give a presentation. Let's talk about no. what real fear is, right? There's some yeah. real challenges in the world. What I I just teach what I know. Yes. You know, pe people ask if I get nervous, and I said, Do you get nervous? Do you get nervous when you go to work each day? And they said, No. I said, What's what I do? And for mm. me, the bigger the audience, 
it's just more people that are going to think I'm funny. And I don't mean that to sound arrogant. I've just done this for a long time. I know. And every time I do it, I kind of watch like what works, what doesn't work. Oh, that one, that got a laugh. Um, that one, that lesson people are writing, I can see uh, what they're writing down. So I see, okay, that one, that clicked with them, that resonated, which of course made the virtual world during COVID so much more difficult. Yes. For what I do is I teach and I present, but doing that virtually as, I mean, listen, for what you and I are doing right now, we can see each other face to face. We're on different sides of the planet. This is amazing. It's a miracle, right? For us, for us, yeah. it's Wednesday, right? It's Wednesday. I mean, it, this is, this is, this is every day for us, for our parents, it's magic. But yes. speaking and presenting and training virtually, as much as those who say, oh, the world is virtual is horrible. It was just horrible mm. because mm. You really can't see the reactions. And if I'm speaking to hundreds of people, they're not even on the screen. So yeah. I'm staring at Cyclops for an hour or two or three and not being able to see what resonates. Well, oh, that clicked. Oh, that one. You could see on their faces that, yes. that light bulbs are going on over their head. So it made it yeah. particularly difficult during COVID. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Totally get that. Okay, so... So when you transitioned, you know, from acting, singing, performing into the yeah. business world and you ran, you said, your own marketing company. Yeah. Yeah. And but, but, as a, but, but as, it came, it came, I was going to say it came from doing business for, for 30 years and then yes. it sort of switched to the teaching part of it. So there was a, a big gap. I, I was singing on it with a club for, for some years there, but I spent my career in business. So mm. my real, my offering is not a talent on stage. It's the business wisdom that's shared. I just have a yes. comfort level on stage because I was a performer. Got it. And, and why the topic of customer experience? What, I mean, first of all, let me just say for all the UK listeners who haven't been in the USA for whatever reason, when I first traveled to the US, I was astounded at the high level of customer service that I got everywhere i go and you know the english people get a bit uncomfortable when american people in stores turn around to them as they leave have a great day they kind of go mm, you don't mean that See, no, i always, I always say that I, you know i hadn't thought about that michael That's they a do really good they do mean do. it i do yeah yeah you do and most americans do mean it and people that work in stores really do mean it you know and because I, well, I'm not a Brit, I'm a Dutchman, but I've lived here so long. I'm a, you know, I call myself Dinglish now. So, yeah, there you go. Um, so we're kind of more like, oh, we don't say things like that. But I remember traveling to the US loads of times. I loved it because I felt like I was a real customer. We don't get that level of customer service in the UK. Sometimes we do. Actually, my wife and I went out for dinner last night in a very nice city and then we went to the theater afterwards and the customer service was amazing and when that happens you kind of notice it because we right. don't get the level of service that we get in restaurants in the, in the u.s etc so knowing that that customer service in the u.s is already really high right and you know that as well because you're you experience it every day sure why did you have to focus on customer experience in business? What, where did you see a gap in that area? That's a great question. And, and I would tell you that many in America would disagree with your observation. I mean, you're comparing it to sort of what you're used to. Um, I think sometimes in the service industry, restaurants and others, it's a fairly high level of service because we tip. That's a big yes. part of it. The standard is is 15, but most people tip 20%, which is pretty significant. But then again, we don't have the VAT, we don't have the value added taxes that you guys do That's in, right. in Britain. Um, but they know that they've got to work hard to earn it. But let me clarify it again. And, and, and it's the sort of the genesis of my transformation in my business is I don't talk about customer service because I think people get that part of it. But there is a significant distinction between customer service and customer experience. And let me explain. Mm. The service is what we provide. If we're a business owner, here's how we treat people. I mean, like I said, we've been talking about for 50 years that, you know, you, you better know how to treat people. What's really fascinating to me is the experience is, is changing dramatically that we as customers experience. How, how easy is it for a company to do business with? 
Um, is it frustrating? Is it complicated? Do we have to do things on the app? Do we get to do things on the app? And so yes. that transaction used to be fairly standard, right? You go up to a register and you pay and they ring it in and you hand them cash. Yeah. <clears throat> and then now we can buy online and <clears throat> we can buy with one click. We can get things delivered to our home. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. So the transformation for me was I talked marketing and branding for, for many, many years, 15, over 15 years. And what I started to see was a real difference, um, a shift. What I taught organizations was how to better craft language that was really persuasive in a marketplace replete with quality players. Why you not can you, but why you, and what we saw was a lot of laziness, right? Anybody in food service would say, um, you know, we start with the freshest ingredients, right? And then they go and like everybody's like, well, you're serving me food. What's yes. the alternative there, right? We, yes. we use nearly expired ingredients, but we pass savings on to, right? But the thing, so I, I helped for many, many years. I helped organizations around the world better craft their messaging in a way that was compelling and memorable and differentiating. But there's been a significant shift over the last probably six, seven years into what other people say about us carries more weight today than what we say about ourselves. People have always been a little bit hesitant. Yeah, it's an advertising slogan. Well, yeah, you say that, but it doesn't. Now we go online and it's Yelp and it's TripAdvisor and it's Rotten Tomatoes and it's Glassdoor and all of those as well. And yes. so I sat about doing sat about doing the research into what is it that's that's causing negative reviews? What is it that's driving people to share their thoughts? Right. And that's what led to my book, Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back. And we're in seven languages around the world. We grew up in business. Everybody grew up in business. And, and Michael, you've heard some version of this, right? We used to call it guest relations philosophy. And here's how it goes. The average person with a positive experience will tell two or three people, right? But somebody with a negative experience will tell 10. We've all been saying that for 40 years. Today, none of that is true. Today, we tell thousands of people. Mm, Today, yeah. we tell millions of people. Today, the mm. ramifications of underperformance are profound and the internet is forever and it stays forever. So when yeah. I talk about the experience and my shift to customer experience is because how we do business is changing, the, the points of frustration are changing. Like anybody who, who we used to talk, I talked to a lot of banks and financial institutions and you would ask mm. a banker, what's your competitive advantage? They would always say the same thing, 100%. It's this, it's the relationship. We have the relationship. We know our customers by name. Okay, well, what happens when 95% of your transactions are on your cell phone, on your mobile phone, right? I, I yes. speak to an organization. They, they, they hand me a check as I leave. I sit in the back, in the back of the Uber. I, I sign it. I take a picture of it and I deposit it in the bank. None of that has anything to do with somebody asking us, you know, so what are your plans for the weekend, which is what we say in America, like, so what's your weekend, right? They're trying to make a connection. I don't yes. have to go into the bank anymore. No. So service doesn't even play a role because I'm never, I'm never talking to a real person, but mm. the experience is still very important. The user experience, right? Do I have to type in my username and password? And if I, if I mess up a letter in my password, do I have to type in my username again? Can I do something? Can it remember me biometrically? Can it look at my face, right? At some point, we're all going to become our own passwords. We know that. And so there's the customer experience, that's CX. There's the user experience, which is UX. And people are working behind the scenes trying to shave a quarter of a second off a transaction because they think if I can help get people what they want faster, right, we have a competitive advantage. Can we simplify our system? Um, yeah. And then, of course, there's EX which is the employee experience, right? How, how, right. And that's more challenging if people are working remotely. So to me, Michael, this is the most fascinating subject today because yes. there's no shortage of customer experience. People that can give you a script and tell you how to say, Oh, I understand Mr. DeGroote. That must be very frustrating for you. Let me help you with, right. We've been doing that for 40 years, Yes, but now we're creating these um, sometimes complications. Like I was at a restaurant, my wife and I were in Nashville uh, a couple of weeks ago, a very nice restaurant with another couple. And I asked the, the waiter, I said, can I get a menu please? And they said, no, you just scan the QR code. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I'm 59 years old. I, I can't read that well on, on my phone, it's too little. Do you have an actual paper menu? And he said, no, you, we just do it through the QR code. And I said, why? And he says, because it makes it very easy for us to update the menu. We could do it every right. day. I said, well, it's, easy. it's easier for you, but is that easier for your customers? Mm. 
And he didn't know what to say. There's so many, my whole book about why customers leave and how to win them back is all about things that companies, organizations, businesses do that make sense to them, right? It, yeah. it makes sense for predictable business. It makes sense for internal workflow and they can predict that and they can look at their cash flow. But I tell them, here's why your customers hate it. And here's why it's frustrating for them. In America, if you go to a doctor's office today, they'll hand you like an iPad or an electronic device for you to fill in all your information. I wasn't trained on that, right? The purpose mm. of it, somebody convinced them as some salesperson, if we automate all of this, your, your, your patients will fill out. And then your receptionist, the woman at the front desk or the man doesn't have to fill out the information. I'm like, yes, wait a minute. So your receptionist doesn't have to do the work. Let's give it to the guy who's bleeding from his head. Mm. Let's give it to the person who, who just was in a, a car accident. Yeah. That's the person that should be doing the work. Yeah. That's we've, we've lost something. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I tell organizations, I said, if you, if you have a new great new process and your efficiency is dependent on shifting your work to your customers, rethink that. Yes. Right? Yes. That's not, that's, that's, that's not a good experience. And so that's my point is, is I get to rant. I get to talk to organizations about the things that frustrate me. <laughs> yes. Right? I, I was at, I was at our, our Walmart and I have a cart full of groceries and I get up to the front and the manager directs me to the self checkout. Oh yeah. And I have, and I said, I'm thinking to myself, I don't work here, All right? I, I, and, you know, I was going to go in the break room and, 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 <laughs> and because apparently I work here now. No, and I'm not trying to be condescending because I try and do it no. very humorously. But the reality is I'm terrible. I'm terrible. My wife is very good. I'm very bad. Every item is an unexpected item in the bagging area. And I it's know. Me, it's going to take me an hour. But they say, but here's what companies say. And this is where I get on them. And they say, no, no, no. We give our customers a choice, but they don't. There's no, one don't. staff checkout lane with nine carts waiting in line and 24 self-checkout. They're trying to push you to do business the way they want you to. Yes. And that's where I come in, right? We, we call our accountants and organizations, our chief financial officers, we call them bean counters, right? So the, you know, the bean counter loves the cost savings when you fire employees and replace them with with self-checkout. Yes. But at some point, what do we call it? The law of diminishing return. At some point, we're so frustrated that we just go somewhere else. Yeah, that's and right. So there's a but there's a balance, right? It's well, it's, not only that, I think, I mean, my wife is always mentioning this issue about where, you know, checkout lanes are being literally in our supermarkets, literally they're disappearing. The checkout lanes are disappearing. And the self-checkout is increasing and they never work. They never work because we're supposed to bring in our own bags. And what if you just have one item you want to just buy and you don't have a bag with you for that? The system can't work. It doesn't know how to work yeah. now because it says, are you bringing your own bags? Uh, yeah, but I haven't got one with me. So what do I say? You know, it, it is so frustrating because the automation has not put the customer. I mean, I wouldn't mind, but it's not put the customer in, in you know, experience at the front of it. It's a technological experience that we then have to get round. And then it goes wrong anyway, and somebody has to come and sort you out. Right. Exactly you know? right. It takes longer because they have to come back. What was yeah. interesting is that at our Walmart, they got rid of most of their, their checkers at, at the uh, at the register. And so, but now as we leave the store, there's somebody guarding the door that checks our receipt and looks in our bag to make sure we didn't steal anything. Oh my God. Oh, and all at every one of them now. And so I go in front, I go, did you, did you think I stole my groceries? Said no, but now people are, you know, taking advantage of this and they're, and they're, they're stealing things. I said, well, if you hadn't fired all your people, you wouldn't have to accuse your your shoppers. Now, yeah. of course, it's not fair to say it's to the person who's by the front no, door. That's just their job. No. That they're. But at some point, I think we're gonna. There's gonna be more pushback. I'm not naive, Michael. I, I know that self checkout is the future. I know that chat bots on websites are the future. I hate them. Yeah, I understand it. Um, we can't necessarily staff our helpline twenty four seven. Right. Mm -hmm. Not every company. So we have that. And chatbot is just an electronic way of doing a, a frequently asked questions. Right. Yes. But I understand them provided they give us an alternative, give us an off ramp yeah. to yeah. a real person. Right. Because yeah. I'm the guy who's on the phone going real person, real person. 
I think you said yes, no, real person, <laughs> right? And, and so, I mean, I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? And, no. and I've and I've been at conferences where they would have like a panel discussion. All the millennials would be up there, and in their in their black t-shirts and jeans and hipster beards and and the little pricks making making whatever. But here's the point is that they get up there and, and they're all cocky and they said, nobody wants to talk on the phone. Nobody wants to, you've got to do this and then this. And we said, the audience, we just smile, we look at each other and say, you get it. You don't want to talk on the phone. Yeah. But how many companies are only serving one demographic? How mm. many companies are serving one age group? That's the challenge today. It isn't one or the other, it's everything. It's omni-channel. Yeah. We have to be able to accommodate every age, every buying habit, if somebody wants to buy on the app, you've got to give them the option to do that. If somebody wants to come in store and look at it and touch it, you got to give them the option. Now, not every business model and all of your listeners and viewers, not every business model aligns to that, but it's, but the overall strategy is the same. And the philosophy holds true, which is give people choices. Um, mm. They, um, I don't expect that I can get my hair cut at four o'clock in the morning, but I do expect that I can make an appointment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So those companies that are, I, I saw a, a, a speaker at a, a really interesting statistic. He said only 26% of companies have adopted an always on business model to accommodate their always connected customers. 26%. Right. That's low. the others that they're, they're falling, they're falling short yes. right? because of uh, we've been changed by Amazon mm -hmm. and Alibaba and all those things that, that allow instant notification. And so yeah. that's what, doing business ridiculously easy um, means. It means don't, don't frustrate yeah. your customers. Don't be overly rigid. Don't say no to things that are stupid, right? That you could easily say yes to. Great. I love it. I love it. And I, I think your message and what you're saying to companies needs to be heard over and over and over again. Um, so thank you for doing that. And, and I fighting. agree, Michael. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Thank you for doing that for us customers. We appreciate yeah. you. That's and the thing. I, I play a part because most of your customers, I'll say most of your customers, they can't, they couldn't be here today. So I'm here in their yes. place. Yes. Yeah. To tell that's you right. to stop, stop frustrating us. You got it. You got it. Even in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And um, so you mentioned earlier in, in terms of your speaking gigs and that you're traveling the country and how comfortable Traveling the world. You are on yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Traveling, traveling the world, uh, 25 countries doing what you're doing. And you mentioned that you use humor in, in, you know, in your talking. Yeah, very much. Yeah. So um, I'm not saying you got to share the humor now, but I would like to know where did you get the humor from? Yeah. And then how did you how do you blend that in to a serious message that you want to give? Sure. Well, but like I said, it's it's very strategic, but it doesn't mean I'm writing jokes. It's just first of all, I'm pretty irreverent. Um, the things that don't come out of my mouth are the things that I stop myself from saying because it might be offensive or a little bit salty or something else. But it's just, you know, I grew up with brothers and we just and and even our way of complaining or ranting, um, I think if you can do it in a way that, that has some humor, it lands. Um, the things that, um, that are, are frustrating to people tend to be frustrating to a lot of people. I mean, if you, even if you look at humorists like Jerry Seinfeld and others, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, he's talking like, why do they do this all the time? Right. If you listen to the core of the kinds of messages, he's, he's relaying scenarios that we've all been there and we've yes. all been through and, and that's part of the, the laughing it's like it's like don't you hate it when people do whatever like oh god i hate that right mm. and so even as i tell stories it's thinking like that i'm like um i was i was talking yesterday i was in phoenix arizona and speaking to a group of saying we've learned over covid that we can have great conversations you know, over Zoom that for salespeople and others, it's actually been, they were very worried at the beginning because we didn't have a chance to be face-to-face, -face, but we can be. And those who got good at this realized that we can have more touches with customers and clients face-to-face, -face, regardless of the distance. And then I show a picture of a guy with a, on a desert island with palm trees, his green screen behind him. And I said, but it's, it's also been two and a half years. And I'm like, oh, look, look at Tim. Look at Tim is on an island with palm trees. That's so funny, Tim. I'm like, it's not funny, Tim. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> no. it's, it's been two years. If yes. I see another 
palm tree or Golden Gate Bridge, I swear to God, I'm going to slash my wrists. Yeah. It's been two years. It's not funny anymore. No. That's the, that's the kind of humor, right? And you smile because you're like, that's right. Jen, wait, Jen, sorry, Jen, 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 Jennifer, Jen, you're on, you're on mute. It's like, yeah, it's in the bottom left-hand corner. It's been two and a half years. <laughs> it's, that right. button is still there. Two and a half years. Did, you know how to unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. Come on. It's, it's, sort of, it's sort of slice of life. You yes. know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's a, it's a great opportunity. But the other thing I do is, is sometimes I'll try something that, that's kind of funny and, uh, or I think may be funny. And then I just watch and I make a mental note. Did that work? Did that not? Yes. Was that, was that a, a nice little comic relief or some, um, but like I said, and, and I tell a lot of stories. I think stories anchor points. I think you put it in within, within, yeah. within the context of, of real life. You know, this whole, your whole podcast is about stories, but when I tell stories on stage, I'll make a point, it'll be a lesson, but let me show you how it applies in the real world. Or I'll tell a story that has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm doing, but now remember it because there's a point that's like, just like in our business, we experience the same thing, yeah. right? As opposed yeah. to, the trite overdone stories like the starfish and everything else that everybody has been telling for 50 years about the guy who picks up a, a, the starfish and throws oh, it in yeah. the water, right? You're not going to make a difference. Well, I made a difference to that one, you know? I know. And then I just I know. throw up in my mouth a little bit because I've heard it 400 times. But I tell people, I say, mine your life for those nuggets. Tell your stories. Yeah. Anybody can tell the story of, of Nike or, or FedEx and the college student and he got an F on his yeah. paper and he made it in. It, we've heard it a million times. Mm -hmm. Tell me your stories. Mm -hmm. tell, yeah. me the, tell me the lesson in the loss. Tell yeah. me about the wisdom born of your unique experiences. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the funnest part. <clears throat> I have a new story that I, that I just started telling in this last week. Um, that has to do with my wife and, and she found her, her father on ancestry.com and things like that. Right. And there's lessons, there's lessons about being bold and using technology and, and all of that. But of course, there's a real big emotional payoff because I got a video of her meeting her dad for the first time and there's, you know, tears in the audience. And, um, and then you go back and you reinforce the point. So, you know, what I do, I think is as much art as it is business. Mm. Um, but I also tell colleagues who are in the speaking world, speaking mm. isn't a business, no. getting the gig is a business. Getting yeah. the gig is the business. And for all yeah. of your listeners and viewers as well, you love to do what you do, but selling it, that's the business, right? Yes. Generating revenue, convincing others that they need your solution or your product. Um, yeah. That's the business, right? It's the sales mm. part of it. And, you know, connected to what you were saying, um, you mentioned it earlier in our conversation, it's great to be, mentioning all the different things that you can do for people it is even more important to share a compelling story because storytelling does stuff in the brain it's been proven yeah. scientifically over and over again i'll send you a little graphic actually that i prepared some years ago good love and, to see it yeah which is just you know stuff happens in the brain especially when you as a speaker on stage a number of things happen. I mean, Chris, is it Anderson from TED um, mentioned this in his video about storytelling, that not only do the kind of, you know, brain waves or neurons, whatever, kind of match up to what are the words that you're saying, but the whole audience's brains, it becomes just one brain, effectively, yeah. the audience. Yeah. And they, you know, all the neurons are dancing at the same time. So you mentioned something emotional that could be sad or funny, right? That yep. locks that locks something in that way, because it's only when you feel the emotion that you will remember it. Yeah. Um, when you, re you remember the lesson because you've anchored it to a story that was an example of something. And I have a, a philosophy around stories and it's something I, I really pride myself on being a good storyteller. But we've heard a lot of people say stories have, have heroes and it's never you, right? Those kinds of things. But the stories also have, have characters and dialogue and, um, and, and twists and turns. Yes. Right? So when I talk a little story about my daughter when she was you know four years old, 
And when I have, I don't say, and then my daughter said this, I say, and then my daughter says, and then I become my daughter, right? And my hands go on my hips and my hip comes out a little bit and I have a little bit of attitude. Um, I, I talk about that, you know, when I was talking about, about banks and financial institutions and that mm. most of your stuff on, on their phone. I also say that when I talk about this and I say, like, I, I go in and present and I take a picture. My daughter's off at university and when she wants money, she just texts me. Right. And I say, oh, by the way, her ringtone is a cash register sound. <laughs> and, every, and, every, and everybody laughs. And so she was home at Christmas time. And all of a sudden you hear this chiching. And she says, what was that? I said, apparently it was you texting me from the couch. And she says, dad, a cash register, really? I said, well, Sydney, you generally want money. It's really insulting. I said, okay, what do you need? She goes, never mind. Right. <laughs> and it gets a good laugh. But I didn't say that she just, said, never mind. I have her going like, dad, what was that? Was that, uh, uh, right? And I'm telling yes. that it's her. Like, I'm not just telling a story. I'm in the story as I'm telling it. It doesn't mean I'm overly dramatic and overcoached, which is a yeah. big problem in our industry. But yeah. we think about we sit down for that family meal, whether it's Christmas or American Thanksgiving, mm. we don't talk about our things. We don't talk about our stuff. We talk about our experiences. We yes. talk about, oh yeah, well, you were the one when we were like nine years old, you were the one that mom always, what, right? We're having that, that conversation yeah. or it's remember the time, right? And it's maybe a, there's a laugh in your voice and that's yeah. a story. It's not once upon a time. It's, I remember I was, I was like 14 years old and my dad was like really on me because I think it was probably really disrespectful at it, right? And then you start the story and you're there with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the story yeah. isn't perfect because at certain points, oh yeah, but, but, but she didn't do the, right. As you're remembering things and, and storytelling, I think can be really compelling if it's authentic. Correct. And far less so when it's rehearsed. Yeah. It doesn't mean we don't rehearse, but I'm a big believer in, in, re, in rehearsing for spontaneity and rehearsing for authenticity. Now, I might have told a story 500 times, but every time I tell it, it sounds like I'm telling it for the first time. And there's an yeah. art to that. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Well, so tell us a little bit more about, you know, you've got five book childs <laughs> yeah your five I have children. all strategically located next to my head here i can I see cura that cura That's curate brilliant. my background yeah oh just perfect. what these little books oh look they just happen to be right I'm, michael so, i'm strategic yeah yeah 100 yeah. percent. no it's good it's good obviously our audio listeners please go and watch the youtube video where you will see the books um yeah. what about what what you mentioned one, why customers leave. Um, I believe you have a new one out. Um, I have a new book, which I, oh, what a coincidence, Michael. It's right here. My new book hey, is hey. called The Morning, it, it's called The Morning Huddle, Powerful Customer Experience conversations, conversations to Wake You Up and Shake You Up and Win More Business. And, you know, I think everything we do is sort of a reflection of what we learn. You know, I've been speaking for, for over 20 years, but, but in that, is an opportunity to work with organizations around the world. I've yeah. had one-on-one -on -one conversations with over 7,000 company CEOs. And I feel like I get a, a master's degree in business about every 18 months, just from what I learned from others. And so my job is to take what I'm gleaning from so many different industries, hotel and hospitality and financial services and dentistry and manufacturing, and bring that wisdom to organizations. Say, let me give you an outside perspective. Yeah. on what's going on in the world. Let me, and we always say in speaking, don't, don't just tell us what you've done. Also tell us what you learned. And so my job is to say, here's what I've learned. Here's how it's relevant for your business. And so the books have a couple of functions. One, it's credibility. You're the one who wrote X or Y, but it's also a way for us to sort of coalesce all of this learning um, yeah. in a way that's saying, here's some specific lessons. Here's some, some steps. This book, The Morning Huddle, actually came from a video series that I created called the customer experience advantage morning huddle. And the idea is to get organizations to spend 10 minutes as part of their morning meeting or the morning huddle once a week or right. create a new meeting and spark conversation. I'm a big believer that the answers are in the room. Yeah. That some of the best wisdom comes from the other people in your company and to create yes. a, a structure for those conversations. So uh, it's not motivation, but they're, they're conversation starters. Do you yeah. ever notice this? 
um, how often have you been asked this? Are we all on the same page in terms of how we respond when this situation occurs? Yeah. Right. And so yeah. my new book, The Morning Huddle, um, which of course is on Amazon, all my books are on, on Kindle and and uh, and most of them are on audiobook, except for the new one because I have a video series. But it's it's very conversational. And for those who yes. hear me on this or have seen me speak before, um, I write with the same voice and I write with some humor. But the book is full of stories, um, mm. stories that illustrate. Um, I tell one story about a time when I was young and I saved up all my money and I bought this record of sixty super hits. It was like all my favorite songs. And I had saved up for weeks because back in that day, our parents didn't buy us the things we wanted. We had to save up no, our own money. That's and right. I sent away and I got the record in the, in the mail and I played it and it was something was wrong. And I, and I, and I played another song and it was wrong. And I looked at the cover and it says performed by the realistics. It wasn't the original artist. It was like some right. band, cover band playing all of them. And I was upset. I was 12 years old and I cried on my bed and I felt like I got cheated. Like I had done everything right. I, I had saved my money. I sent it in. I waited. I did everything right. And I got cheated. And I use yeah. that as a lesson, right? How often do your customers believe what they're getting may not be equal to what it is that you're delivering? Not that oh. we're intentionally trying to cheat anybody, but is there a disconnect between your offering and their expectations? Was there a communication huh. problem? Was the picture much more... Um, uh, beautiful than the actual product that they receive yeah. or the yeah. quality. And so yeah. I use stories like that to spark a conversation, not just the lesson, but a conversation. So what does your team think? Have you ever been through that? Have you had people come back to you and say, um, you said blank or they got frustrated? Well, here's why, because yeah. nobody wants to feel that. So yeah. this whole book and my video series on the morning huddle is about sparking conversations and ultimately coming up with a consensus. Here's how we as a team are going to handle this. Here's what we believe. I, had a, I, I did a, a Zoom call with this big organization over COVID and they had all gone through my series and everything else. And one of the guys says, I got to admit that there was a couple of those that we really didn't agree with you. And I smiled. I said, oh, you're not supposed to agree with me. You're supposed to agree with each other. Yeah. My job is to be the catalyst for the conversation. Yeah. I'll give you the perspective of the customer Here's why you do it. Here's why we hate it. Here's an alternative approach. But ultimately, it's your business and you make the decision. You just have to make a decision. Otherwise, yes. otherwise, everybody's doing their own thing. And then your customers get an inconsistent experience because yeah. there's no consensus as to this. So that's the part I love to do is just spark the conversations. Even when I work with a company and come in and present, whether it's an hour or a full day, it's, I always say at the beginning, the answers are in this room because you do this every day. My job is to be the catalyst to spark yeah. some of those conversations. Yeah. And so that yeah. was kind of fun. It's a little bit of a different book this time about sparking those conversations. I I think it's, it's genius because, you know, there are stories in people's heads that they don't share and they just hold on to. I mean, I won't mention the company name, but I've had an ongoing customer experience issue with one particular company that has been running now for over 12 months and they still haven't got it right. You know, they still don't know how to solve the problem. And I've had to deal with probably around half a dozen people who were going to try and solve the problem. But and part, I'll tell you, Michael, part, yeah. yeah, part of the challenge is, as I said before today, the ramifications of underperformance can be profound because everybody's armed with a bullhorn. What if you were one of those people that said, I am done with this. I'm going to go on a campaign. I'm going to talk about it on every podcast. I'm going to post five times a day. I'm going to call out this company. I'm going to make them pay. And the reality is, Michael, there are hundreds of thousands of people around the world who have that, that mentality. I'm, I'm not proud to admit that I wrote a blog post about it. Oh, I, first... I do it all the time. When it first started, and I get, a I get response very quickly. A year ago, and I did get a response from the managing director, but then he did come some way towards solving my issue, but then has been very quiet. And then I tweeted about it too. And the tweet got a lot of views, which I don't have a massive audience on Twitter. Right. And did you hashtag the company and did they respond yeah. at all? Yeah. 
yeah, they did. They did. Yeah, they did in the, because I tagged them. Yeah. <laughs> as well. My guess you know, is it, my guess is my guess is it's a very large company. It's no, it's not huge. Really? That's surprising. It's not a they... huge company. But what's happened is they merged with they bought another company into the fold right. to make themselves bigger. And those two were a different division that I'm was buying a product from. And they've not been able to get the two systems to talk to each other. So yeah, it's you know, the integration. Just, everybody's, got, two... everybody's got a story. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, the integration wasn't good. And yeah. um, but I I have had many examples, but I was going to mention one company in particular who I continually am impressed by. And you probably know the name, but it's Apple. You know, heard of them? Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> I all, all my devices. If, yeah. If I have an issue with an Apple product or software, I can ring a person. No. Yeah. They ring me. <laughs> right. I put a note in to say I don't even need to give them my phone number. I just put a login to the support thing ticket. They know who you are. They know who I am, and the phone rings. And it's magic. <laughs> And not only the, that, they spend the time to solve my problem. Right. And the I mean, so much the... so, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story, yeah, David. There was an iPhone that just did not work. I emailed Tim Cook. I didn't get a response from Tim, but I got a response from a senior person in Apple who is regularly on, you know, when the, their keynotes. And he emailed yeah. me back. And said, I would like to get to the bottom of it. I was astounded. That's you know, awesome. like a well, vice a lot, president. Oh, no, I was going to say, we hear a lot from, from others is that they'll use that as an excuse to be dismissive. Well, I'm not Apple. I can't do it. No, you aren't. But there's lessons in that. Yes. Lessons yes, in terms yes, of, yes. Just of responsiveness. I mean, yes. it, 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 it's incomprehensible that a situation with this other company has gone on for a year. Somebody yeah. needs to own it. Yeah. Right? I think yeah. he's the person. So when I call now, and if I'm on my third or fourth or fifth call with an organization, the first thing I say is say, I listen, you are the fifth person I've talked to. I need a hero. I need a hero who's going to own this and stay with me until it's solved. Great. And it's remarkable the response I get sometimes. Well, listen, we're going to, we're going to get this taken care of. And I said, I appreciate it. And there's, I'm frustrated, but I will tell you, I'm not frustrated at you, but I'm very frustrated with the situation. And I'm sorry that you got stuck with me. But I really need a hero right now. I need yeah. somebody to help because I cannot spend any more time. And sometimes that alone sort of empowers individuals. Yeah, that's. A, I'm going to use that. Thank you. <laughs> I got it because it works. David, how can people get a hold of you? Find your books. Uh, give us your website, your socials, and, and sure. let's share some stuff. I am everywhere online at davidaverin.com. The last name is A-V-R-I-N, davidaverin.com. Just search me on Google. All the, all the, the uh, social media platforms, it's at David Averin. The only difference is Instagram. I'm uh, the real David Averin, but that's a whole catfish for another day. Uh, but uh, <laughs> plenty of information. But uh, I'm, I'm fortunate. I, and I, get, I come to the UK several times a year as well, heading to Dublin uh, at the end of this month. And so I'm so thrilled that that international travel is back and an opportunity for me to work with clients and audiences face to face. Fantastic. It's been wonderful to hear your story. How much fun. Journey. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really, really great. And if you do come to the United Kingdom, please do give me a shout and maybe, you know, we can meet up and have some lunch together. Would love to. Would and, love to. Um, I wish you massive success with everything you're doing. It sounds amazing. You have a podcast too, right? I do. A little sign behind me right here as well. Yeah. Mine's called I just the, customer experience, the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast with Great. David Abern. So I, what, a, what a thrill and, and best of luck on your work as well. I, I, think you, I think you've got the right approach. I think the stories are so important and anchoring yeah. that to the business messages for your audience, um, I think is really valuable. So I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. I appreciate you being here and take care and I'll be in touch soon. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.